Are you ready? Okay. Uh, also, Jackson, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. This is Stacy Krim. I'm with Elliot Kimball doing an oral history on June 12th, 2019 as part of the Pride of the Community project. Thank you for speaking with us today. Yeah. So, uh, where are you from originally? Raleigh, North Carolina. Lived Raleigh. there all my life. Yeah. <laughs> when did you move away from Raleigh? Um, when I started at Appalachian State for my undergrad in communication, which was um, fall of 2007. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What was the climate like in Raleigh? Um, I don't know. I mean, I wasn't really fully in touch with that part of my identity, um, and I don't. Yeah, I never really thought about it. I always felt like I could be um, myself. Um, that didn't, at the time, really include like a out and proud in terms of my specific identity. I do not feel like I had to conceal like the way that I felt naturally to behave or or what have you. Um, but yeah, I don't ever remember it being something that I noticed in Raleigh. Like overly, I was never overly aware of like. LGBTQ people or LGBTQ events, like I never felt like that was hyper present to the point where I was aware of it in my busy childhood mm -hmm. teen life. Yeah. And then you moved to App State. I did. And what was the climate like there on that campus? Yeah, I mean, I, I felt like, I don't know, again, like I wasn't, I wasn't really in touch with that part of myself. I'm very much a late bloomer when it comes to thinking about how we think about coming out in terms of being um, gay, but... Um, I don't know. I found I found App State to be diverse in general, um, but I know that that wasn't the case for a lot of students. Um, you know, I am white. Um, I also brought the privilege of being pretty aware of kind of surrounding North Carolina, like what that felt like. Um, but I think I felt like it was diverse because I think there was a great deal of diversity in the group of students that were super, super involved. Um, and that was me, um, maybe overly involved. Mm -hmm. um, so I felt like we had that representation in the in the student leadership, but mm -hmm. I, I think in the overall, we were still um, a thoughtful campus. I never felt like there was um, any hate, but again, I wasn't really in touch with all parts of I am now, all mm -hmm. parts of myself that I am now. Right. Yeah. And you continued at App State as an employee there? I did not. Did you did not? No, okay. I um, did my four years at App State and then moved to Charlotte. My undergrad was in advertising, and okay. so I worked for um, about a year in Charlotte doing corporate copywriting. Um, it was painful. I was <laughs> chained to a cubicle and never again. Um, and then started pursuing graduate school and um, went back after taking a year off, not really off because I was working in Charlotte, but a year away from higher ed and then um, went to South Alabama. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, was, what were things like? Were you out by then? Or? Yeah. I mean, I was pretty open with everybody um, at South, which is the shorthand for the University of South Alabama, which is in Mobile. Um, but I, I mean, I felt like it was still very Alabama, but also... I, when people are like, oh my gosh, I can't believe, like, you know, kind of like you, they're kind of taken aback that I spent so much time in Alabama. Um, and I, Mobile is just strange. I mean, in a great way. It's mm -hmm. a port city. Um, it's much more New Orleans than it is typical Alabama. Like, it's just a lot of culture and, you know, it's the birthplace of Mardi Gras. And so that in itself is like a, a true celebration of expression. So I love Mobile. Um, I felt like it was... I, I don't know. I felt like it was one of the most open places I lived. Um, I know that's not the case just from driving through the state. I mean, once you left Mobile, I think Mobile and then I would say maybe Birmingham because it's so young professional. But other than that, the rest of the state is still mm -hmm. um, like you heard. <laughs> it's, they have some work to do, but um, yeah. And what uh, degree were you pursuing? Master's in Educational Leadership. So did you knew you were going to want to stay in higher ed? I did, yeah. And when I did my Master's in Educational Leadership, I worked um, as like part of my degree program to help pay for the degree. And I was a community director, so I oversaw our on-campus housing for our fraternity and sorority students. Um, and that was kind of my focus in the beginning of my career in higher ed was fraternities and sororities. Mm -hmm. um, and I think being like, I think what some people would refer to as flamboyant or maybe more feminine or just um, 
animated, which makes some people uncomfortable, um, and working with, um, you know, the, the few very stereotypical Southern SEC-minded fraternity men that I did, I still found them to be very open. Um, because I think that with students, once you've kind of invested in them and shown, like, I'm going to do something to help you here, um, I think they find it hard to hate you. Uh, that's not the case for everybody. But it's also like a community model that we're seeing on lots of campuses. Um, particularly, I think it's echoed in like this model I've seen a lot between campus police um, and students that don't feel safe in settings where police are present. Um, and we do it here on campus. Um, Honors College helps facilitate it, but they play games and do icebreakers and like build relationships. And I just think in general, you build relationships with somebody, you invest in them, you care about them, you know their story. It just makes it harder to stereotype them and it makes it harder or for your brain to stereotype them, whether it's intentional or not, but it makes it hard to hate that person. Mm -hmm. You maybe, maybe, maybe take more of a back seat and say, I disagree with your lifestyle or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I think I didn't experience any hate um, from students particularly. I mean, there was the occasional thing. Um, maybe more at like the city or state level that you know made me hyper aware mm -hmm. of being gay in Alabama. Um, but no, yeah, it was good. And there are many positions you can have in academia. What is it specifically about working with students that attracted you? Yeah, um, I think that I, I really like investing in students, like just pouring time and energy into students and. Um, no matter what I'm doing, I always like to talk to students about like, where do you see yourself um, as someone who was hyper involved in college. I felt like I checked all the boxes, I made the good grades, I signed up for every club and leadership opportunity, and then when graduation came, I was like, but where's my job? Because I did everything right. Um, and so I try really hard to when students are involved with something that I'm in charge of or helping support, I try from the very beginning to help them think about like where do you see yourself? Um, and not to apply pressure, but to apply kind of a sense of reality because we do exist in this bubble and depending on their their upbringing, they may not be used to having to work as hard as um, college students have to work. It may be new to them, but also understanding that like, these, I mean, I think the reason I got hired for my first job and the reason obviously I went back into higher education is those out of the classroom experiences. And they're so, um, they form the experience for so many students. Some, some would say even more than their academic discipline. And so um, that's why I chose student affairs because it gives me more opportunities to have that direct impact. And then also I just have a sense and just from seeing students go from A to Z and beyond that like I know that that kind of ripple effect is there mm -hmm. um, that I've hopefully had an impact that will last students for a long time. Mm -hmm. So so from that job, where did you go? UNC Asheville. Okay. Yeah. And so my job there was, um, you know, one title many hats because it was a very small school, mm -hmm. 37, 3900 students. So my job was assistant director in student activities, involvement, and leadership. And so I oversaw Greek life, which is very small, but then um, that job was kind of what sparked my passion around diversity and inclusion. UNC Asheville is a very white campus, but a very queer campus. Um, and so finding a way to kind of like fuse those different types of diversity, um, yeah, there was just lots of work to be done. And I was lucky enough to sit on like the campus-wide diversity, equity, and inclusion committee and just be involved in a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And so that's what kind of sparked my interest. Um, and then when I came to UNCG, I originally came to UNCG to start my PhD full time um, in the Educational Leadership Cultural Foundations program here. Um, and then this job was open in the interim. And so I took it, put the PhD on the back burner, and then after a year was offered the position permanently. And so um, the PhD is permanently on the back burner. <laughs> Just because right now I'm I'm really just enjoying working, doing the work mm -hmm. here, and there's just not time, um, at least not time to also like live a social right. outside of work existence that I I require. Right. Yeah. So what year was that when you arrived? 
Um, I got here in July of 2016. Okay. Yeah. And you were the first person in the Office of Intercultural Engagement that was full-time specifically working with yeah. LGBTQ students. Yeah. So before me, there was LGBTQ plus outreach and advocacy, which is kind of like my functional area. Um, it was a GA ship for a master's level student, usually in the student affairs program or the counseling program. Um, and that was the person that handled everything. And so um, Sarah Colonna was one of those people, you know, she's still on our campus. Um, yeah, but I was the first full-time mm -hmm. professional staff member, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and coming in, what was the climate like for you? Um, I mean, I felt like there was just, just tons of room for growth. Like there just hadn't been enough time and enough resources committed to this area that like everybody that had done the work was just doing the work because mm -hmm. um, they knew it needed to be done. And the, all of those people are still doing the work. And so it makes my job, um, I wouldn't say easy, but it makes it, you know, very collaborative. And I'm so appreciative of that. But, you know, there are people who have been on this campus for a long, long time doing this work. Mm -hmm. I think about like Jeannie Irwin Olson and Brad Johnson and, um, they're really good teachers, but you know they've been fighting for for this and for our growth as a campus to be um, I think what we're still seeing is kind of like um, this need to operationalize or formalize and match the resources and the attention to what we know is this major existing population on our campus and kind of what is seen and has been seen I think since like the 80s as an underground, um, queer campus, mm -hmm. um, whether UNC Queensboro, UNC Gay, um, and you hear that from alumni too. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that, um, yeah, we've, you know, I, I think that that's where people have wanted to see it go and that's where hopefully I've been able to, to push it in that direction, but I think we still have so much more growth to really see like a formalized celebration of yeah, we are a majorly LGBTQ plus campus and they those students make up a great deal of our population. And so being able to assign the resources and the attention and being able to see those students and their narratives celebrated at the very highest levels, um, that would be a huge thing. Mm -hmm. um, and when you arrived, were you aware of UNCG's reputation as being an LGBTQ friendly? I was 100% not. <laughs> um, <laughs> And even as someone who grew up in Raleigh, not that far down the road, and was like really aware of the UNC system, all my friends pretty much that were older than me went to a UNC system school. Um, but no, I had absolutely no idea of the, the kind of back history, unofficial history. Yeah. Okay, so you arrive and there are some, um, there is some framework for education and outreach in place. Can you talk about that framework as well as how, what you did to improve it and go beyond it? Yeah, so Safe Zone has been in existence at UNCG for a long time, and I don't even want to put a number on it, but some people would say it's been one of the longest running Safe Zone programs in the country. Um, and so the structure and kind of the awareness on campus that there was a safe zone program was already there. Right before I arrived, we kind of, um, people who were before me arrived at sort of like a curricular structure where we are now, which is safe zone 1.0, a safe zone 2.0, and a trans zone. Um, and so I just really amped that up, amped up the offerings, amped up the ways that we were able to deliver it. Um, and then where I think I've seen the most growth is just by having a physical body in the space. Um, I've created gender and sexuality educators for so students that we're training to also help increase our capacity. Um, and every year I think we see almost 100% increase from the year before as to private workshops that are requested. Whether we're being brought into classrooms, whether student organizations recognize that they could do better in this area, departments, I mean I can't even tell you the number of people that we train in private or kind of like captured group requested workshops is just extremely high. Um, and it allows people to, whether they've done Safe Zone or not, to get a really intentional and thoughtful and specific kind of workshop um, and education for exactly what they're looking to do. And so I think that's been the area where I've been really successful in terms of extending Safe Zone. Um, the other thing that there just wasn't time for was somebody really wasn't, didn't, there wasn't manpower to devote to major programming initiatives. So 
um, like our drag bingo and our drag show, which now they happen um, in the fall and in the spring. And we, um, I was able to create the collaboration with Campus Activities. So we bring five to 700 students to those events every semester. Um, and those are now campus-wide events, which are recognizing, you know, the celebration of a community. Um, and then, you know, we have our Sex Ed for All program. And all of these programs are critically collaborative to the point where, like, I don't, I wouldn't want to have to try to do it without my collaborating partners. But we partner with Planned Parenthood here in the area, the Mid-Atlantic Planned Parenthood, and put on Sex Ed for All, which is um, sex ed, gender inclusive, inclusive of gender and sexual orientation. Um, I've kind of been able to expand our LGBTQ lunch and learns, but that has always been something, I say always, I'm not exactly sure, but has been something at least before I arrived, I know that there were LGBTQ lunch and learns. Um, so that structure was kind of in place. Um, and then again, it just really goes back to time. So I've had the time to devote to cleaning up our resources and getting our website um, up to a place where students can access those resources. Um, because a GA doesn't have the time in the office because they're pursuing a degree, I think I've also been able to provide a, here is Elliot, here is Elliot's office, here is Elliot's space. And so I see a lot of students on a one-on-one -on -one basis trying to help them navigate campus as a queer person, um, overcoming hurdles, helping remove some of those barriers for them, whether it's policy or in the classroom experiences that they're having that might be negative. Um, and so a lot of it really is just time. And then um, my background is in programming and my passion area is really professional development for faculty staff. And so um, merging all of those things together in addition to being able to just have the time to see students one-on-one, -on -one, I think that's kind of where I've mm -hmm. advanced it. Can you speak at least in general terms a bit about talking to students and what the students need and what the students uh, are stressed out about or what they're coming to you, the issues they're coming to you about? Yeah, so I think in a general sense, we hear time and time and time again, it's one of those narratives that's pretty thematic across the whole time I've been here. We hear from students, regardless of how they identify, that yes, UNCG is diverse, but we are not inclusive. And so I think that um, in some way, shape, or form, almost everything I hear from students falls back on that inclusion. Um, and so whether it is being misgendered in the classroom by a faculty member intentionally or not, that's something that I see a lot from students. Um, navigating names on campus, navigating systems and policies that continue to push out the name that they don't identify with. Um, finding their community outside of campus. A lot of our students are looking to find nonprofits to work with or to find a community off campus. Maybe they're non-traditionally aged. Maybe they're um, coming from another campus as a transfer and they're looking for something that they had on their previous campus. Um, and then obviously students who are just looking to find um, their group here on campus, their clique. And I think that happens at UNCG a lot more organically um, than it maybe happens formally. I don't think it happens as much, at least not enough to be representative of what we know as a huge, robust queer community um, in student orgs, at programs. I think students really find their own, their group in, in very organic ways. Um, and engage with them. Mm -hmm. And that's that's really typical of what we're seeing now with emerging research around Generation Z. Um, that the way that they want to get involved, the way that they want to lead, and what they're looking for in terms of engagement just looks different than it ever has before. It's not going to be as formal. They're not seeking out student organizations. Um, technology is the largest part that it's ever played in any generation, and sometimes that interrupts their um, ability or um, desire to engage in one-on-one -on -one situations, so that impacts our programming numbers and that impacts, um, you know, membership in student organizations, persistence, staying engaged. Um, but then I think it also, on the other hand, things like Lavender graduation, right? Like we still see them seeking that recognition and wanting to be celebrated. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, that's that's a lot of what I see from one-on-one -on -one with students. They're looking to get engaged. Um, I would like to say that that was like the primary, but usually it's a lot more like crisis intervention, like really trying to help navigate on-campus policy, procedure, spaces where they don't feel welcomed or included. And um, yeah, it's usually that they find me because they right. need me. Um, and can you talk a bit about uh, the needs of trans students on our campus? Mm -hmm. 
Um, Especially in light of HB2 and its fallout. Yeah, so I think um, I, I think that uh, when HB2 happened, when I was at UNC Asheville, I think that student affairs practitioners and people who just care that work on a college campus in any capacity struggled to really quickly try to regain their footing as like, hey, but we're still here and you still matter, uh, when everything going on in the legislature was telling these students that they did not. Um, and was also perpetuating a message that we, as people who are supposed to care and advocate for students, were going to in some way be enforcing this. Um, and very much this, um, this narrative of dragging people out of bathrooms. And I think that was, that was perpetuated. That fear was built up across the entire state, even nationally, got lots of attention. Um, and so I think that um, yeah, we've seen kind of a retraction of the harshest version of that bill, but I think that um, I, the newer the student, the, the more I even wonder. I mean, we did the Ashby Dialogue last year, as you'll remember, and uh, that was focused around HB2 and the impact of HB2, and there were so many students that just had no idea what it was. Um, but I think that after it's explained, I think the remnants of that are still really present in our state. I think we still see a lot of conversations around public facilities usage, and they just feel like they may not know it was called HB2, but they feel like it's an ever-present theme in conversations in North Carolina, um, both in the legislature, but also at like specific city town levels about the usage of public spaces and um, bathrooms, facilities, et cetera. Um, but I think that, you know, we still, um, we don't have sex education in K-12 through public schools, right? And even if we were to have some sort of mandated, formalized curriculum there, it would likely not be inclusive of LGBTQ students. And so I think that is something that they're coming in with, right? That baggage um, of feeling like they have no idea anything about their bodies, even more confused if they're LGBTQ, and that's not something that they receive as like a main narrative in the media. Um, I also think we see it in terms of how hard it is to legally change your name in the state of North Carolina. I mean, I saw a ranking the other day that we're like, I think in the 40s in terms of most difficult states to change your name in. And so, um, and some of that, unfortunately, I think is reflected in campus policy where it's, it's difficult for students to be referred to by the name that they're using or that they use. Um, and so I think that, um, again, I think students, including other students, good, positive. I mean, I hear really positive things, and I think even students who we would consider to be um, less aware, or maybe they they experience or um, very much hold like hatred or discriminatory feelings toward a specific population, I still feel like there is an active hate on our campus, um, at least not as much as there are on other campuses. And so I think that, you know, even if students show up and they're like, I just really don't understand this trans thing, or I, I don't accept those people, that's, it's a phase, it's weird, whatever, whatever they may, however they may frame it, um, I still feel like they're, they're existing in spaces with trans students. Um, and so I think that that's really affirming. Um, I think that out of like the probably the 3,000 students, that's an estimate that I've trained in the three years I've been here, only one has not known what I meant when I said, can you share your pronouns? Completely different from faculty staff, right? And so I think just the era in which students are growing up in um, and coming into college, the awareness, like, yeah, we got a long ways to go with representation, but it's just such a part of their daily vernacular, LGBTQ, queer, trans rights, trans issues, that they're at least aware. Um, and I think that that is powerful in terms of like the feelings of what would be considered to be dominant identity groups or students holding dominant identities. Um, yeah. So I don't know if that answers your yes, question, it does. but okay. Um, so I know in the past, when you looked at the approximate age students would come out, we would expect them to start coming out in college. And yeah. now we're seeing LGBT or LGB students coming out much earlier. Yeah. How about trans students? Oh, I don't know the exact research, but I, I do know that, um, you know, we're seeing more and more, we're hearing people who are talking about their children who are 
it's probably not as um, probably they're not using the right language, at least in terms of an academic setting. But you know, we're seeing more five, six, seven, eight-year-olds who are really grappling with this idea of gender, um, and that's not. I don't think that's strange, specifically from like a if we think about like a developmental psychology perspective, you know, children are grappling with this idea of gender and have a pretty, what they can't form it into words, but they have a pretty concrete understanding of what gender is by two or three. And so if they feel like they're being shoved in a box and they feel like that box is continuously filling up with more and more things that don't match the way that they identify, um, they're experiencing discomfort earlier, earlier, and they're, they're still at a place where um, they're not experiencing peer pressure and they're not experiencing like a pressure to not say what's on their mind. And so they're verbalizing it sooner and sooner. And there's lots of child psychologists that are, are trying to help tease apart the difference between is your child just expressing themselves? Are they just playing around with um, what it means to be a free spirited child and not to have yet feel like they have to be stuffed into a box? But um, or are they actually experiencing some sort of gender dysphoria? Um, so I think, I, I don't know what the answer is. Um, I mean, I do know that, like I saw a statistic the other day that like one third of transgender Americans eat and drink less because they're afraid of using a public restroom. And so mm-hmm. I think, I don't know as much about the coming out. Um, I, I would say that it probably is happening younger and younger, just like LGB. Um, but I think that... Um, the safety planning that is required to come out and the considerations of can I even exist safely as a person after coming out, the pressure of what that level of safety required to come out is much, much, um, is more for trans students and trans people. There's just a, a lot more they have to think about in order to be able to physically, day by day, wake up and navigate social and societal spaces as a trans person mm-hmm. that maybe LGBT, LGB people, excuse me, don't have to deal with, so. Do you see, see some of our trans students that it, they're taking this opportunity being away from their family to use that to process um, their identity to, to trans? into their identity. Yeah, no, 100%. And I I think it's a pretty common narrative, too, for students who are having to kind of fall back into um, their sex as assigned at birth or how they've been expected to present um, the most of their life. They kind of have to fall back into that and put on a face when they go home. Um, Because for a lot of our students, um, their ability to come to college relies on their family and their ability to be financially stable. And so um, that's hard. But yes, I think that that's, I mean, I think that's a college thing, but I particularly think in this day and age, like more and more students are coming and um, feeling comfortable playing around with this idea of gender and trying out things and, um, you know, feeling like they can really be themselves. And I don't know if this is a national trend, but I think my personal feeling is I feel like the pendulum has really swung from when I was in college, 2007 to 2011. I felt like queer people were going to give you five or six or seven or 12 different words to let you know how they specifically identified as opposed to now I find that young people college students are much more apt to just use the term queer because they appreciate the fluidity they appreciate the kind of the power and the reclamation of this word it isn't as much of a dirty word for younger people they haven't grown up with that being as much of a slur as even I did um and so I think in the same way we're seeing a lot of people who are identifying in ways that are trans, but also just more gender diverse, Mm non-binary, gender queer, um, moving away from this idea of transgender, one, because it's associated with a lot of misunderstanding, right? People think that transgender is A to B, B to A, and on the other side, you're presenting in a very hyper-masculine or feminine way, and that's just not the reality. Um, But I think we're also seeing more and more students who are identifying in ways that, that allow for them to make their own rules. Um, and they, they, I don't think that they feel like that is um, always the case, even identifying as trans. And so that I do see as being very much a trend. Um, and not trend in terms of like it's a fad, right? But I think it's maybe a theme is a better word. I think it's something, a common narrative that I'm seeing across a lot of students. Mm-hmm. So you've touched a little bit on this already, but you do a lot of training with students. Yeah. 
Um, what are some themes and trends you see in terms of how the, young, the generation is accepting or having a difficult time understanding gender and sex concepts? Yeah, so I think, um, again, like I think that younger students are just, they're more prepared, um, and I don't want to sound ageist, but it really just is about the language and the culture that they're growing up in. Even if they grew up in what would consider to be what we would consider to be like a really sheltered environment, maybe a hyper-religious environment that imparts some sort of heavy feelings around LGBTQ people. Um, you know, that's a pretty common narrative that we hear here in the South and specifically in North Carolina. Um, I still think they are at least aware. They're aware of LGBTQ people. They're aware of what it means. Um, I don't think they're as freaked as maybe people who would be in the same kind of situation 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. Um, and so I think that that's, I think that that's the same thing that I see a lot in training with students. I think that often too, they might be feeling a certain way, but they feel like this politically correct culture doesn't allow them to ask those questions. And so sometimes I deal with some pretty tough questions, but I also have to realize that, you know, yes, we're at a place where these people who may, um, this, you know, students who feel a certain way about LGBTQ people, right? Um, that may lead them to be discriminatory or have some sort of prejudicial thinking around them um, that could ultimately harm LGBTQ students on our campus. When I think about those students, that that space that I'm creating for education might be the first time where they feel like, wow, I really feel like I can comfortably ask this. He said that there were, you know, no bad questions or whatever I said that maybe made them feel like this was the space. Um, But I also think that this politically correct um, culture has also... Um, impacted negatively dialogue. I think that, yes, conversations are hard to have among a diverse group of students. There are people who are asking questions just because they genuinely want to know and they're immediately shut down because people's assumptions are that they're coming from a hateful place. So I also think that, you know, students are growing up in a in a time where, um, yes, they are less likely to express hate, but I'm afraid that they're also less likely to ask questions that they really need to ask in order to better understand and affirm and include people, but they feel like they can't. Um, yeah, and that's just the reality. And I think that that has a lot to do with the lack of education in K-12 through schools around LGBTQ identities, which is getting better and better, but you know, there's work to be done. Um, I see the same kinds of questions when we do sex ed for all, and students come in and they ask what you would, what people would think to be just like, a really, well, duh, kind of question about their bodies or about queer sex or something, and you're just like, well, actually, no, that isn't crazy to think that they're asking that because they've had no preparation in this area. Um, And I think it's the same way in the classroom. I hear questions that would probably shock a lot of people Mm -hmm. um, and might come out as offensive, but I think that there isn't as much space for them to feel like they can ask those questions because we're so quick to say, like, well, that's offensive when they might be coming at it from really a well-intended place of just trying to understand. Mm -hmm. Um, So you're in an interesting position where you're going into a potentially hostile situation. Mm -hmm. So you don't know, you're doing training, you don't know what you're walking into. Yeah. And you're in a position where you may, your identity could be personally attacked. Yeah. Um, How do you, what techniques do you use to open dialogue and create that environment? Yeah, uh, where people can ask the questions, but the uh, tension can be diffused and, and a meaningful conversation can happen. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think there are lots of strategies in terms of just like good question asking and good dialogue asking. And I encourage our, my students that I work with really closely to do this, too. I think we are so quick as humans when something feels like it's personally attacking us, our immediate Um, is our immediate feeling is to react, right? And that reaction is not logical. It's not well thought out. It's very honest. um, And it doesn't make it any less valid. But if if the space is meant to be created for education and for people to learn, um, that is not always the best response. And so I will say I've gotten kind of a thick skin around it. So I can sometimes compartmentalize and say, like, I'm doing this work versus, like, me existing as a gay person. Like, it... It it doesn't necessarily, I feel like I've kind of put up a wall there, but there are times where I kind of have to step back. And so I kind of, when I do that, I kind of try to reverse the order. So as opposed to reacting, I would think, okay, well, what is, what is kind of the end goal, right? And so maybe the end goal is pausing, right? And giving space for maybe somebody else to jump in. 
And so I think if you're particularly in a group and you feel like this is this is really attacking me and my identity and you really don't think you're able to formulate words that are going to be helpful, um, then just sitting back and being quiet, right? And processing that silently on your own. Because usually another student will jump in on my behalf and say, let me help you rethink this or let me provide another, because students are in that position a lot where they're having to educate each other and educate their peers. Um, the other thing I think is sometimes when a person asks a question or they make a statement that is very general or can be very hurtful or um, stereotypical, it's just not logical and well thought out, a good dialogue strategy is to just ask them a clarifying question, right? Because sometimes they'll talk themselves um, into a better place on their own. You can say like, um, I'm kind of confused what you meant when you said that. Can you reframe it? Can you rephrase that? Um, or why did you say that? Asking them specifically, like, why did you feel like to include that? Why did you feel like that was needed in this space? And sometimes they'll be like, oh, okay, well, maybe it came off the wrong way. This is what I meant, right? Because I, I think helping them think about, you're really giving them a second chance, and a lot of people don't get that when they've said something that can be considered really damning. It's like they're not given a second chance. And so those are kind of like my two biggest strategies. One, asking those clarifying questions, but two, trying to think about the reverse order of like, what would I do instead of react and then take my moment and then logically question it or logically argue it. I try to take my breath and my break and then maybe react later <laughs> when I'm out of that space. Um, Cause I'm still responsible for, for making sure that space stays safe or brave as it can for other people. And so sometimes you kind of just have to take it on the chin and you know be like, I will process this as a personal individual issue later. Um, yeah. So um, that's dealing with students, but I imagine the dynamic of working with and training faculty and staff is, is a bit different. Mm -hmm. Can you speak a bit about your faculty staff training and some of the difficulties you see faculty staff having in understanding the needs of the students? Yeah. Um, I see it less with, with students and more with faculty staff that people, um, they come in already deciding that they're not going to learn anything from a training that I'm doing and that they they don't want to be swayed by this and they have immediately written me off before I even enter the room, right? And that can be one of the issues about a training being mandatory or you being voluntold to be there um, is that people, you know, they can be in the space and they can very much have already decided that this isn't going to do anything for them. And so um, that is something I see more with faculty and staff than I would like. The perk about working with faculty and staff is they're adults, right? So I can sometimes take a much more direct approach with them when something is said that um, isn't the most logically thought out kind of statement or something that um, doesn't consider everybody that's in the room or doesn't consider a diverse, you know, perspectives. Um, I, I think that there's more space for me to be really direct. Um, and so I also think that with faculty staff, um, you know, you're still trying to maintain a space where there could be queer identified people in that space and you want them to feel as safe as you can make them. And so sometimes things are said and you kind of have to call it out and then take a moment and then after the session or after the workshop, call it in and have that educational moment. Um, I don't see that as much with faculty and staff. I think that people are, they're either going to shut down and not say anything um, or they're going to try really, really hard to be PC. Um, but again... Well, I don't know if I should say that because I think students are trying really, really hard to be PC. Faculty and staff sometimes not so much. Um, sometimes everything in their personal history, they've lived a longer life and that is working against them and their ability to be able to have a conversation about something that is very foreign to them. So that would be kind of the big differences. I can be more direct. I feel like I can get um, better results. But I also think like really perpetuating this idea that whether whatever your title, whatever is in your job description, this is part of your role, to care about students and to create spaces where students can learn. That very much uh, requires you to have an understanding of identity and an understanding that students are gonna bring their whole selves into the classroom and um, into educational spaces, other, other places on campus, and how you can do that. I feel like that was a ramble fest, but... No, it made perfect sense. Okay, cool. Um, and what concepts in particular do faculty and staff have a difficult time dealing with? I think anything after the T in the alphabet, right? <laughs> so I think that 
Um, we're still seeing faculty and staff who, and again, we're talking about people that are usually at minimum 30 years old, particularly with faculty, right? Because there's a degree attainment that has to happen there. Um, but then there are lots of people that have been on UNCG's campus for 30, 40 years. Um, and I just think in general, like I said, the culture was different when, um, you know, anybody besides the current generation was growing up. You know, we've seen advances over and over again, but there's... There's just, it's not part of the daily vernacular. It's just not, it was not part of, you know, the things that they talked about. And so um, I think that the questions that I get most from faculty and staff are about transgender students, gender diverse students, pronouns. Um, I often jokingly say like, I've, you know, screwed up everything and denied everything you learned in fifth grade biology about there being two sets of chromosomes. And now I'm gonna do the same with everything you learned in fifth grade English in terms of talking to you about how to use gender neutral pronouns. Um, and it, I mean, it is, it's an unlearning that has to happen. And I think the older you are, not to be ageist, but the older you are, the longer you've lived in a culture and an environment that was less and less inclusive, the older you are. The conversation was just not being had. And so you have more to unlearn before you can relearn. And that takes a commitment that I think some people are just not willing to make. And do you work with um, training other institutions in the area or other community organizations? I do. So one of the things I'm really lucky to do is um, I do a lot for community colleges because they just don't have the resources. So Rockingham Community College, Davidson Community College, Alamance Community College, Forsyth Tech, Guilford Tech, almost all of those I work with on an annual or um, twice a year even. Um, and then sometimes I will get asked, I, a lot of times I get asked to do like corporate trainings and things like that. And that's just not my job. Um, unless I can t say that it's having a direct impact on students, um, then I can't really justify it. The other thing about the power and being able to have an impact at community colleges is so many of those students are getting an AA or getting a start for a semester or two and then are transferring to UNCG. So I know that that's having a huge impact. Um, one that kind of seems like out of my purview, but I very much felt like it was important was they had an issue that led them to seek training around including gender diverse people. Um, the Guilford County or Greensboro Transit Authority. Mm -hmm. um, so they were having issues specifically around busing and IDs. Um, and I was like, you know, the, a great deal of our campus community in some way utilizes the bus system or public transit to get to and from campus. So I was like, this is something that um, could really have a powerful impact. So I, I did a training for them and they were wildly receptive, which was wonderful. Um, and so I think that, you know, I feel like I kind of live in a bubble. I think we all do in higher ed. Like it seems weird when you interact with people outside of higher ed and they seem like they just don't have these conversations about identity and inclusion and social justice as regularly as we are called to have them. Um, but I don't feel that way in Greensboro. And it's one of the reasons I've been very nomadic in my life. And so besides my 18 years in Raleigh, which wasn't really chosen. Um, but I think like, you know, I've never really felt like I wanted to stay anywhere or put down roots anywhere for a long time until I got to Greensboro. Um, we're, you know, as of the last few years have been ranked the most LGBTQ friendly city by the human rights campaign. That doesn't necessarily speak a lot to culture. That speaks more to kind of like economic justice and policies that are in place to protect LGBTQ people. But we just have so many LGBTQ run businesses. We just have so many queer powerhouse voices on um, all levels of our local government. Our mayor is extremely affirming to the point where she used to serve as the executive director of the foundation for Guilford Green. Um, I just, and, you know, and I find that everywhere I go in Greensboro, it just is warm and fuzzy and very affirming for LGBTQ people. This is the first place where I feel like the conversation in the community um, even close to matches the conversations that are being had on campuses. And I think we should be a little ahead in any space, you know, um, educational institutions, higher education, they're supposed to be culture centers, right? We're supposed to bring together all parts of communities and really be like the leading edge. So I think we should be a little bit ahead, but it's refreshing to see that there's a community that is keeping up. Mm -hmm. And I did, even when I lived in Asheville, which people think is like, you know, the queer hub of North Carolina, um, I, I didn't feel it as much as I feel here. So Can we talk about a bit in Greensboro in general, what yeah. the social life is like for LGBT people and some of the community organizations that help cultivate that? 
Yeah, so I think that we have Guilford Green, which is an LGBTQ nonprofit. They do an incredible amount of work. Um, they've started an LGBTQ center, which is soon to be moving downtown, which is going to be really incredible just for the fact that people can walk by on a busy thoroughfare and see that we have an LGBTQ center. Winston has had one for a long time that's done a lot of really critical work in their community. So I think this is good for us. Um, a personal passion point for me is the Triad Health Project. Um, they do an incredible amount of work supporting people who are living with HIV and AIDS and preventing HIV in our community, um, which is also something that I think younger and younger LGBTQ people have had the luxury of completely forgetting about. That so much of our community was wiped out in the 80s by the AIDS crisis, and that was a major defining point for the LGBTQ community nationally, but that there was a lot of impact seen in Greensboro. Um, and so that work is still really, really critical that's happening with Triad Health Project. So I think that, that um, that's a huge part of it. I think you know putting on major community events like Green Queen Bingo and the Gay and Gray Nights that they do for LGBTQ um, people, I don't want to call them elders, but they refer to them in some way, um, people of a certain age, that's a community that we often hear as generation silent. Um, LGBTQ plus people who are over the age of 55, 60. Um, and so they try really hard to engage that community. Um, I think there's a really robust drag scene, which I mean, beyond just the the drag as being a source of entertainment, I think that the culture around drag creates a space where people feel like they can be themselves. Um, can you I, talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I just think that when um, people are in spaces where there are um, entertainers, um, LGBTQ plus entertainers, that they feel like they can be more themselves and they feel like it's an open and free space. Also, I think if people are aware of any kind of aspect of LGBTQ history, the gay rights movement in the United States, particularly from what we would consider to be like the watershed moment of Stonewall, this is the 50th anniversary mm -hmm. in 1969 in New York, that was led by drag queens. It was led by drag trans women of color. Um, and so I think people are aware that drag has an important history in, um, in the movement. And so we kind of see drag queens at the forefront of everything that's happening in Greensboro LGBTQ related, and that's really powerful. I say queens, but drag entertainers, drag kings, non-binary drag performers, um, and we're lucky that we can bring some of them to campus. Um, yeah, but I, I think the one thing that I think we w I would like to see more of is, and I hear students talk about this, is we currently just have one um, one strictly LGBTQ, it's in the name, it's in the mission, um, social establishment. Um, and it's more of a nightclub, and it's definitely not what people who I think are you know, 25, 26, 30 or older are really looking for, but they'd love to find like a queer inclusive, queer run, queer focused kind of social space. Um, but even then, I think that even establishments that would be considered more heterosexual, um, more cisgender, their clientele would be less queer, that they're even trying hard to let people know that they're, they're still safe and they're included in those spaces. And I'm lucky, I live downtown, and so more than somebody who might live a little further out from like the city center, I see it all the time. Um, I see reminders of um, in-store windows and car bumper stickers, and I just, I feel like there's reminders all over that like, this is totally a space for queer people. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of room for growth, as there is just in the movement in general, in terms of how we look at the interse intersections of sexuality, gender diversity, and race. Mm -hmm. And I think specifically thinking about our community in Greensboro and the history of the powerful civil rights movement, specifically that happened right downtown, um, and the role that Greensboro has played both statewide, regionally, nationally in the civil rights movement, I think there has to be more conversation about specifically how we're including, thinking of, celebrating queer people of color. Um, there are lots of um, groups that exist, maybe less formally in Greensboro, that work to kind of bring to the forefront the issues of for queer people of color, but I think that that's a national intersection that we have to focus on. I think this whole idea of capitalizing on pride, that whole narrative on a national scene is still very white um, and still very heteronormative. Um, and so I think there's work to be done there. And I think with Greensboro, we carry an extra weight because of our history as a civil rights um, 
I don't want to say Mecca because that sounds like heavy, but you know what I mean, like mm-hmm. a center point for right. civil rights. I think we carry a an added um, responsibility to really celebrate queer people of color mm-hmm. um, and that you can't have conversations around social justice, around queer inclusion without having conversations around racial justice. Mm-hmm. It, they've just got to be hand in hand. Right. Um, so you mentioned that uh, the leaders in the Stonewall riots, since we're approaching, we are in the anniversary year of that, um, were uh, queer people of color. Yeah. Can you speak a bit about what the Stonewall riots mean to you? Yeah. Um, and so I, I think that um, Stonewall was like the kind of the history and the what the expectation was in that time is when um, you went out as a queer person in the late 60s that um, you were required to wear a certain number of pieces of clothing that were specific to your gender or probably at that point your sex is assigned at birth. Um, and if you didn't, that could be you know grounds for arrest and you were kind of opening yourself up to discrimination by law enforcement and even other people. And so that I think is what led to kind of these underground spaces where people could come and be themselves. But then very quickly, if there were you know a police presence, that those kind of things had to go in the trash and they were able to very quickly turn around and present in a way that seemed less um, maybe conspicuous. And so um, leading up to the Stonewall riots in 1969, there were more and more of these raids, police raids on establishments that were um, maybe more conspicuous for being inclusive of queer people and then um, when we saw, you know, what is considered to be the Stonewall riot at the Stonewall Inn in New York, which was a popular establishment, people stood up, right? They stood up and said, no more. This is not happening. And they fought back against the police. And it really was a watershed moment in terms of bringing these issues that had previously been happening behind closed doors because they had to, this violence that queer people were facing, queer people of color, um, bringing that to the forefront. Um, in terms of what it means for me, I, I just think that there's power in knowing that um, those members of our community that are still at the very furthest margins, um, queer people of color, trans women of color, um, drag queens, like that they, they have such a central part in our history. And it's sad that we're still having to fight really, really hard to keep them as part of the mainstream conversation because they should be from the very beginning. Um, I say from the very beginning, but most people in gay rights thinking about it from a Western perspective, an American perspective, think, well, gay rights started in 1969. That's not true. But I think from thinking about it from a Stonewall lens, yeah, 100%. Um, So that's what it means to me is it's a reminder that, you know, it all started with a brick. It all started with, um, you know, a trans woman who just wanted to be who she was and faced additional discrimination for being a woman of color and also for... Um, being a drag nightclub entertainer. You know, I think just all these layers of oppression and then being able to fight back through all of that and leading leading us to a different place. Um, And I also think, you know, we've seen lots of interpretations in the media of Stonewall. We've seen movies, we've seen documentaries, and so many of them are done really poorly. They are extremely whitewashed, um, and they just don't give a good perspective of what it was like. And we're so lucky we're, we have so many people who would be considered queer historians that were alive. They lived it. You know, we're st- you know it wasn't that far back. Um, we have people who can still very much tell their story. And so I think we need to rely on that and celebrate that we still have people who, um, you know, lived through Stonewall. So many of them died during the AIDS crisis. And so I think that that's why that has to be a central part of the conversation, too. Um, I think one of the things I'm loving right now is a new, sh- you know, the new show Pose on FX. Um, you know, we kind of saw this like very similar feeling of kind of this behind closed doors creating of your own community in a nightclub social scene in the 80s in the ballroom culture, which is what Pose talks about. Um, but that again was a huge space for queer people of color. Um, and again, it, it kind of should be a reminder that we had this watershed moment in 1969, but then there was still a great kind of cultural underground movement that was still needing to happen in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, specifically for queer people of color because they still weren't part of the conversation. Um, and I think we're still there today. We're still a very whitewashed movement. We're still a movement led by the gay white man who is cisgender and that they're there's just there's still lots of work to be done. So that's what it is for me. Stonewall is a reminder that you know, queer people of color have always been here. They've always been at the heart of our movement um, and they need to be part of the mainstream conversation 
every second of every day. And if they're not, then it's truly not inclusion. Um, yeah. Okay. So you've spoken a little bit about it, um, the generational differences between LGBT, pe LGBT people, you know, 30 plus yeah. versus today's uh, generation coming into school. Uh, what can you, can you talk a bit about those generational differences? Yeah, so um, my kind of go-to like touch point is my mom and my dad, obviously, because I grew up with them, um, and even my extended family. So I kind of tend to categorize people like who are my mom's age, and then people who are a little bit younger than my mom, and then people who are a little bit older than me, and then people who are around my age, which would be you know in their thirties, um, and then um, college students, right? Um, and so, I, again, I, I think I've said this a lot, but I think the generational differences come from what our society valued when you were in your formative years. And we choose the spaces that we want to be in, right? So, and it's, there's lots of research that shows that we like being around people that are like us. It's just our natural human um, instincts to be in spaces where people look like us, love like us, believe like us. Um, and so I think that instinct combined with where the national conversation was around diverse groups of people, period, specifically LGBTQ people, um, being less and less and less of a conversation, more and more as we go further back, a demonized conversation, right? So these people are, these LGBTQ queer people, these communities are demonized, they're stigmatized. Um, and so I think all of those things combined with that instinct to want to continuously put ourselves in spaces where people believe the same things as us doesn't present much challenge in terms of our thinking. And so I think that that's kind of where I see the intersection of generational differences is what was the conversation on the national, state, local stage when you were growing up, when you were sort of forming who you were? Um, were you allowed to be who you wanted to be or who you felt like you needed to be? And the intersection of that between, the intersection of that with um, just our instinctual putting yourself in spaces where you're around other similar people. Um, it just doesn't lead for much conversation. It doesn't lead for much challenging of each other. It can, it's just not likely. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, and I think more and more now, we're seeing people be challenged to put themselves in spaces where they may identify as a minority when they, in that space, when that's not something they experience on a daily basis. You know, all of these things I think are more and more just part of the national conversation. Um, we're starting to see diversity as um, something that is super critical. And I think we're doing that by imparting that the importance of diversity and being able to engage across difference as a critical skill, a critical life skill. We're starting to see that too in how we prepare graduates and how we graduate culturally competent. I don't really like that word because I don't know if we can ever be culturally competent as though it's an end destination, but um, more culturally understanding, responsive graduates. Um, again, I felt like I just went on a ramble fest, but no, that if that was clear. Your rambling sucks. Next. Thanks. <laughs> so you train a lot of heterosexual gender cis people to mm -hmm. be allies. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> can you speak about what's essential for someone to be an ally and how to be an ally once they leave that training? Yeah, so one, I think that um, one of the things that as institutions of higher learning we've done a bad job about is this whole idea of like a certificate model. And I've tried to move away from that and I will often joke like people will key my car in the parking lot for a safe zone sticker because that's just the way I think that the human mind works, particularly academically focused people. We're just used to being like boom, boom, boom and it's a master's degree. Boom, boom, boom and it's a doctorate, right? And so I think people are like, all right, so I need to boom, boom, boom and then I get my certificate and I'm kind of done, right? Like I am safe, I am a safe zone. Um, things just change too quickly and our campus population changes too quickly for anybody to be able to rest on their laurels. And so I think I utterly despise the word ally and the more that I do this work, I didn't like it as just like a gay person for a hot minute and then just coming in to do this work more and more I'm like Bleh. Just gives me the heebie-jeebies. Um, I will often joke and say, like, your bumper sticker does nothing for me, right? It doesn't do anything for queer people. 
um, this whole idea of capitalizing on pride has led to a very chic trend in being LGBTQ inclusive. I wear all of this rainbow stuff and I do this and I do that and I whatever. Um, but it's presented more and more opportunities to feel like I'm a good human, I'm an ally, I'm honoring my training that I went through with Elliot while still not putting themselves in spaces to continue to be challenged. And that's not easy. Um, there's uh, Glenn Singleton, who's like this racial justice education person. He writes the, I think, the field, the field Guide to Racial Equity in Schools. He often talks about this idea of sitting in the fire. And that's what it feels like. And that's okay. Um, it feels like you're sitting on an actual active fire when you're in a space where you are the minority, specifically if you are not used to having feel like that, feeling like that, or haven't felt like that commonly in your life. Um, and so I really challenge people to move away from this idea of allyship. I think if you want to use ally as a verb, cool. Allyship is not a destination. Um, and we kind of, again, I, I really believe that there's work to be done in individual communities, but um, we're really only going to see the needle move if we can zoom out and look at all marginalized people and their struggles as a social justice movement, which really honors the fact that people are intersectional. We're not culturally competent. We're culturally complex. People check more than one box. Um, and I think that that's why I encourage people to think about allying. You have a dominant identity. You check a privilege box in one way, shape, or form. Um, and so that gives you a responsibility to then ally, right? So allying for people, not just LGBTQ. I think the LGBTQ community, or at least people educating around queer rights and identities and concepts have kind of co-opted the word of ally, but it really is a responsibility that should be put on anybody that identifies in a dominant way to use their privilege and their space to then put themselves in spaces where they can be challenged and to raise up voices and bring voices to the table that aren't typically there. So the word that I will encourage people to use is advocate because I just think, yes, this may seem like semantics that it's just all about you know language and there's just minute differences, but I think advocate is like requiring a level of action. Um, and one thing that I think we're just really bad at in terms of people who are seeking to be allies um, and I think sometimes our human condition and our social programming does, doesn't do us justice here. What we don't ask enough of is how can I support you? Because with media narratives and with the common understanding of, well, I'm woke, as the kids say, I know what it means to have a gay friend and I have a trans friend and I'm super inclusive. We're trained and socially programmed to say, okay, somebody comes out to me as trans, I probably need to think about where they're going to use the bathroom. I probably need to think about how we can shop for clothes. I probably need to think about all of these very binary um, issues as opposed to just saying, how can I support you? Because their, their need in the moment um, is probably not one of those major thematic issues that we have been told um, are at the top of that list. So step one, ask how you can support them um, and do everything you can to celebrate them without tokenizing them. Um, I think if you're lucky enough to have built a relationship with that person, nothing really is changing. The connection with you and that person isn't changing. And so on the other hand, that also doesn't invite you to ask lots of questions that wouldn't have been appropriate otherwise. Um, we can no longer accept the excuse that people don't have ways to educate themselves around people that identify differently than they do outside of just asking people. Um, there are many, many ways, including events on our campus, that you can go and sit in the back and you can listen quietly and you can soak up people's experiences. There's just more, there's more ways to do that now than ever with access to online research, access to documentaries. So many marginalized people are sharing their narratives through blogging and online solely for the purposes of educating other people. So, um, there's just, you know, I think there's more of a responsibility to do your own work as an ally or as an advocate. Okay. We'll use advocate from, from this moment. Okay. And I like that too. Okay, good. Um, so we are in North Carolina and we are a state institution here at UNCG. Um, and of course, North Carolina has had um, some issues legislative, legislatively uh, relating to um, discriminatory policies or lawmaking against the LGBTQ population, how would you recommend uh, faculty and staff or people in general 
especially working in a state institution where that is a delicate matter, how would you recommend um, approaching advocacy for LGBTQ students and people in the community? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, you you do what you do in your personal life when you're not operating technically as a state agent and there's opportunities for you to advocate outside of your formal role. Um, but I think also, you know, there's nothing that has been legislated that prevents people from showing that we care. And I think if you can show students that you care um, and think about all the ways that students are picking up what you're putting down, right? Like, how are what are all the signs that they're picking up on? Um, have they emailed you and that's their first interaction with you? And have you been thoughtful enough to put your pronouns in your email? That's one sign. Do they show up to your office or your department's office or to your classroom? And does everybody in the artwork on the walls not look like them, not love like them? And that's very apparent to them, right? Like, I think we forget about all of the signs and the ways that we, just as humans and as people, ingest an environment and really quickly decide if it's our place or not. Um, and so I think that there's nothing that's been legislated um, that says that you can't show that you care. And I think part of that is being really, sometimes it may feel overly and exhaustively thoughtful about all of the different ways that people are interacting with you and the environment you create and the environment that you oversee. Um, and I think it can be as simple as every time somebody asks you where the bathrooms are, you're saying gender specific restrooms are here and single stall, single use restrooms are here. Like if we can train ourselves to respond in a way that is thoughtful and inclusive every single time in our most general everyday conversations, then we're moving in the right direction. Um, and so I think that, you know, we kind of just have to fall back on being a good person, um, which looks differently for everyone. But I think that authenticity is speaks volumes and we're lucky enough to be in a place where you know educational institutions hopefully create more of a space where we have this vibrant community it hopefully doesn't feel like specifically for faculty staff you're coming to work in this what might feel like a dry nine to five you have interaction you can bring maybe a little bit more of yourself to work than you could in other settings um, and I hope for specifically for our queer faculty and staff that they can do that on our campus unapologetically um, but that authenticity, if we can find ways to convey that to our students in just how open we are with them while still being professional, which is totally doable, um, I think that's part of the caring. You know, we're giving part of ourselves to our students so they feel like they can give part of themselves to us and that investing in each other. So I don't really know if that's an answer because, um, I mean, the, the, the typical line is trickier um, that we kind of have to toe, but I think being thoughtful, being authentic, those are all buzzwords now, but I think that that really is what we have to do as people who work in a space where we are required to care about students, that means all students. And if we think about equity versus equality, some students need more help um, because they're not on a level playing field. And we know that our state and um, our community, you know, we just have work to do. And so take that responsibility as a personal responsibility did that answer the question? Yes, it did. Yes. Good. Um, okay. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about that I haven't covered? I don't think so. Are you sure? I have one question. Okay. Ask a question. Um, Mike, so okay. <clears throat> so all of my LGBTQ friends are Generation Z, and then all the people we've interviewed are older baby members. Um, there's definitely a generational gap between their views on the pride parades and then you have a unique perspective because you're a millennial. Um, what are your views on that, on the generation gap? Uh, the baby boomers, for example, usually have more negative views on it, on the promiscuity. Mm. And then I've, all my friends definitely love them. Okay, so what is the, what is Elliot's view on the generational gap between baby boomer LGBT populations and Generation Z, especially in relation to pride parades? Yeah, and it's, uh, Good question. I think it's hard to answer that question without making pretty sweeping generalizations about certain um, generations. Um, I don't know. I think that, um, again, it goes back to what they, what people who, uh, depending on how they grew up during their formative years, specifically for LGBTQ people, I think for older LGBTQ people, they might, again, I don't want to generalize, feel like they fought so hard just to be able to exist in a space. And they feel like 
they did that in a respectful way and that in some way the current nature of a lot of our pride celebrations that are very sexual and very open and to some people seem really promiscuous they feel like they're that that is um undoing the work that has been done but i think on the other hand um at the end of the day when we're talking about what it means to have pride in yourself it means that you're standing up to an institution and a system that has prescribed everything from who you love to how you dress. And so with that, um, we see a lot of that governance in a sexual way. And so I think it may seem over-sexualized, but we have to think of it as it's really just pushing a ba back against what is probably a an unfair and overreaching norm of what is okay to be presented and open when we think about sex and bodies and how those things have been unfairly governed in the past. It's kind of, I think it's kind of like a, you know, taking pride in yourself sometimes seems overly sexual because you're also trying to regain autonomy over your own body and your ability to express yourself and express your body and your sexuality in ways that, um, that have not been allowed and that may be the first space where you're allowed to do that. I also think that um, there's still going to be this, there's just still always going to be this underlying connection and sometimes it's very overt. Um, people make it very overt, but this connection, this fallacy that there is a connection between perversion and LGBTQ identity. And so because of that, I think even two people that are perceived to be of the same gender, maybe making out at a pride parade, that can still seem overly promiscuous just because of the nature of the world that we live in. And so I think some of it is coming from that perspective of we fought so hard just to exist and you're taking advantage of it versus the feeling that like, you know, this is everyone's individual pride and they celebrate pride in the way that they want. And that often looks very, very um, wild, but only if you can't see that people are having to push back against decades, centuries of tradition and expectations. And we kind of have to flip the script and think, is the system that we're operating in unfair? And thus your argument that these pride parades are too sexual and promiscuous also unfair? I don't know if that answers your question. That's just the dumping out of all my thoughts around that. I don't have a real, I don't really have a personal opinion about it. I think that everybody should be allowed to take pride in themselves how they want. And um, I would hate to think that we reach a point where people can't do what they want and be what they want at some sort of pride celebration. Because um, the last thing we need is a, 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 an event that is meant to be uh, resistance against systems and governance and the stripping of autonomy to then also be policed and governed. And we see that a lot in the LGBT community, policing each other and policing what you can and can't identify as and how you can and can't identify. And we just have to realize that that's, that's an extension of the policing that happens of and has happened historically for queer communities. And so doing that within our own community, we're not doing any good there. Excellent. Do you have any other? All right. Do you have anything else you'd like to add? I think I am done. All right. Well, thank you very much for speaking thank you, with Stacey. us. Thank you, Stacey.